we got to talking about Steffi's boots in the nine o'clock class because she needs the boots and the scarves and Steffi's like, I can't believe we're wearing freaking boots today. <laughs> so we're gonna go over this again. Um, as you as you look at this though, was it legal? And what what were they gonna do with the poor folks, the poor houses? Compensate They were what's that called? Eminent domain is what it's called. We're going to pay you what a reasonable person would pay for your house, which means they weren't going to give them that much. They weren't going to have enough to be able to continue to live there. Did the Supreme Court say it was legal to take their houses, even though it was uh, not that big of an area, not that wealthy of an area, uh, and we could certainly make progress with, with jobs, with income taxes, with police, with roads, with fire protections, all of these things, or did they say their property is their property, and you know what, we need to protect it like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration. Yes, it's legal. It is legal to do this. Yes, it absolutely is. So as long as you can demonstrate that you can do something positive and productive, yeah, you can get ultimately, yeah, you can ultimately take somebody's property. You, In, in fairness, it's eminent domain. They're being compensated, but they're not getting compensated for the memories and things like this. They're just getting compensated for the bricks, for the cracks, for the glass, for any of these kinds of things. Uh, not the president's call dealt with what? Who has the power to declare war? Congress. Congress does, and a lot of people think it's the president. Why did they not give it to the president? Why did they give it to Congress? Go ahead. Separation of powers? Uh. The argument was, yeah, part of this was a king idea. Part of it, too, was if we've got over 500 people making the decision in Congress, there's a better chance that we're going to have a better debate than if only one person is entrusted with this. The Congress has the power to declare war. What power does the president have? Hard to, uh, the to power the to war. control the troops. You could argue, I think the article even says, the power to make war is what the president has. So keep that one in mind. Oh, land grab, we talked about child porn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what was the porn article? Digitally remastered. Digitally remastered porn. And is it legal to digitally remaster porn to make yourself look older or younger? No, no. no, no. it's not. And you can use props, we talked about. <laughs> you can use props to do this, but, but you can't actually digitally remaster. The Rutgers article up here, it's not really about Rutgers. That's the revenge porn. We talked about revenge porn, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, revenge porn being after you break up, you exchange some interesting sex sexts. Be careful on camera. Some interesting sex, and then you would actually go to a website and publish this publicly with maybe a person's name or contact information or things like this. They want to have the revenge porn law, but they haven't done it yet. Don't worry about Rutgers. We never got to that, and, and that's probably one we're going to lose to the weather. But the child porn law, which was a 7-2 to two vote, and the revenge porn law are probably pretty good. The assault on powers was just a quickie. And that was the one where I had mentioned to you, talking about separation of powers, checks and balances, that in order for something to get done, you need two branches of government of the three to agree. One branch by itself is not going to be very good. And this was talking about Congress and President to declare war, Congress and President to pass law, President and courts to deal with the judicial prosecution, you know, these kinds of things. And there was one section of this article in that first column of it that I had actually read off. Might not be a bad thing to think about if you, if you get a separation of powers, checks and balances question. Um, chapter 3. The Arizona, the death penalty, and the Oklahoma laws, I think y'all should be pretty good on these because we're running out of time, but we just covered them. Oklahoma was dealing with the abortion. Remember, there were two laws. And y'all were kind of interesting because the first law that was dealing with requiring people to view the fetus if they wanted to get an abortion, it was close to 50-50, but there was a slight advantage for people saying no to that one. In all of the classes that I've ever taught, nobody agrees with the one where you don't tell the mother if there is some kind of a birth complication, you know, with the fetus that she's carrying, because that nobody has ever agreed with that. So, you know, those were the two laws with that. Arizona immigration, what is it that the police must do? A, a what? A what? A police encounter. Is there a better way of saying a police encounter? So if they, they can just come up and talk to you. And then, no, you have to have reasonable suspicion, I think. There's got to be reasonable doubt or reasonable suspicion. Okay, so a traffic violation and reasonable cause or suspicion or doubt sounds very different. As long as... 
traffic. Wait a minute, why are you still stuck on the traffic, Steffi? Now, now the, the Hispanics in Arizona aren't good drivers, it sounds like. Wow. It, it's actually a lawful traffic, or a lawful stop. A lawful contact is what it is. See, you got me thinking about traffic now. A lawful stop. And the idea was basically this. The police cannot just come up to you and ask for papers or documentation, but they can ask for papers if they've stopped you for another reason. So if there is a traffic stop, they can ask. Or if you've witnessed a crime and you're helping, as crazy as it sounds, they can ask. Yeah, you don't worry about this one. Yeah, you don't worry about this one yet because you're in the other class. But for our purposes, if they've got this, then they can ask for the papers. There were four parts to this law. Do y'all remember the four? Bans on transporting, bans on hiring, bans on housing, and then the paper request. The housing, the transporting, and the employing all got struck down. Not because they were doing any service to the people that may be illegally here, but because there are already federal laws that ban people from transporting, housing, or employing. The thing with the papers was upheld. It is perfectly legal, and if you're in the nine o'clock class, Jose, tearfully documented the other day how he was, we well, didn't cry, but you know, he documented the other day how he had been detained for hours, if y'all from the nine o'clock class remember, uh, he, he just out in Arizona, they didn't give him a ticket, they thought he was there illegally, then he had to show his Maryland license, and it just seemed to go downhill from there. And the ar argument is, is that this sounds like Nazi Germany. What was Arizona's argument in favor of needing to do this? Too many what? Too many. Too many, like, too many of How many? It was too many. It was like half a million. It was like 460,000. You could round it up yeah. to half a million, this kind of a thing. And they said it was costing how much to Arizona taxpayers each year? Millions. Hundreds of millions, millions of, of dollars. dollars. And their argument was the federal government has failed us. We need to take matters into our own hands right now, and we need to stop this. Because if the federal government would be doing what they should have been doing, we wouldn't have to frickin' deal with this. Um, do you remember the humane execution? What was the trick with humane execution? Can't feel pain. Can't feel pain. Uh, the death the penalty is legal, and it is not a violation of the Eighth Amendment, cruel and unusual punishment, as long as you do not feel pain. And as you go through that article, yeah. as you go through that article, be looking at some of the different examples, American or otherwise, where you could have felt pain, and in fact, other ones where you wouldn't feel pain, like what's allowed today. Uh, last bit here on the terms, and just to give you an idea, uh, devolution, revolution, that was the Reagan thing, slow the growth of government, actually cut it, but he never cut it, he ultimately just slowed it. In the beginning, do y'all remember what the relationship was between the federal government and state government in the beginning of the country? States were more powerful. States were more federal. powerful at the beginning, and the federal government was really far lower in terms of power. Today, it's completely flip-flopped, and what you see is the federal government is where the power is, and the states, they, they're the ones that are really along for the ride. Pretty straightforward in that terms. Um, express and implied, we went over the other day. The four examples, privileges and immunities, tax and spend, commerce, and full faith and credit. Y'all are good with those because we had already covered full faith and credit. Those other three, make sure that you know examples as you're dealing with those for the exam. So what was the example of the tax and spend power that we talked about? What policy was it? Something that affects y'all more than any other group. The drinking age. Yeah, Kara, when in doubt, just yell out alcohol, right? The drinking age was the one with tax and spend. Privileges and immunities was the one that I told that dealt with me. Do you remember what that one was? The unemployment benefits is what that one was. And then commerce, there were a lot of freaking examples. So with that in mind, just, just keep, you know, a number of those. Guns, prostitution, you know, anything that, well, what are the two factors that, that kick in the, the federal con commerce power? Uh, it has to be across the state. It has to cross state lines. Somebody help her out. Goods and, services. goods and services. The exchange of goods and services that crosses state lines. And as long as this happens, then the federal commerce power kicks in, and the federal government's commerce power is the biggest power that they've got. Do y'all have any questions about anything up here? Where's dual federalism? Dual federalism. Anybody remember what dual federalism was? It was the period between when the states were high and now today when the federal government's high. Dual federalism is basically from the end of the Civil War until FDR came into office in 1932. 
where the states and the federal governments exercised about the same levels of power. Any other questions? In the beginning? Oh, we, we, we just did that. We okay. just did uh, that, yeah. Sorry, yeah. focused on I won't edit that part out. Focused yes. on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we can get to ideology. Ideology is the belief quizzes. And you're in the 11 o'clock, right? The 9, the nine o'clock. Okay, I gave you all the belief quiz today. And I'm going to try and figure out a way to get that thing filmed. It might not be until tomorrow. But basically, the gist of it is, and, and I'll go ahead and hit this now. These four are, are dealing, the, the bedroom and the wallet quiz is dealing with government's role in terms of economics for wallet and government's role in terms of morals with bedroom. And the idea behind the quiz really is to get a sense of, okay, if I know how much you believe that government should regulate or not economics, or how much government should regulate or not morals, when I put this together, we can actually get a pretty good prediction of what it is that your political beliefs are. So for our purposes, in minus minus, if you don't believe that government should regulate economics, if you don't believe that government should regulate morals, you're going to be a libertarian. Because libertarians are generally going to believe that the smaller the government is, the better. Libertarians are going to believe everybody should stand on their own two feet. You earn yours, he earns his, he earns his, I earn mine, and then we all go forward. We rise or we fall on our own merits, and government largely stays out of our personal business, money or what goes on behind closed doors. Liberals are a little bit different. Liberals are going to believe in regulating wallet or economic issues, but staying out of moral issues. So when you think about it, you know, gay marriage, morals are gonna, or liberals are going to say, we don't want to touch this, this is for the individual. When it comes to abortions, liberals are going to say, we don't want to touch this, this is for the individual. When it comes to school prayer, liberals are going to say, we don't want to mandate this, but this is up to the individual. And you can kind of see a theme there, this is government staying out of people's personal business. Libertarians would agree with most of that. Okay, liberals, in terms of economics, though, are the exact opposite, in the sense that they want to regulate economics. Nobody should be able to just open a strip club across the street from my house. People should not all be taxed at the same percentage, but they should be taxed based on, when you think about it, what they earn, because otherwise we're really screwing people over if we force them to be taxed. The wealthy at 10% and the poor at 10%, that 10% for the poor is going to mean more to them than that 10% for the wealthy, say. So that's what they're saying there. Now, Republicans are the exact opposite of the liberals. And when you look at the Republicans, the Republicans are going to believe that we regulate morals, but we stay out of the wallet issues. Regulate morals, but stay out of the wallet issues. That 11 o'clock class had a lot <laughs> of people in it that believe pretty strongly in regulating morals. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it, and it was almost surprising. Um, some, like you, Becca, are actually very greedy. And you said that, in fact, the government, on seven of seven occasions, should not regulate your money at all. And there were very few people that actually went seven for seven on anything. Now, Ross, you're my liberal. I knew it. There was no surprises there. But the Republicans are going to say, I earn mine. I get to keep what I earn. You earn yours. You get to keep what you earn. And you know what? Let's go forward. Republicans are going to say, though, you know what, we do need to impose prayer, school prayer. We do need to regulate and maybe even end abortion. We do, when you think about it, in not just abortion and, and these other things, but same-sex marriage, come on. That's not traditionally the way the country's been. We don't want that kind of a thing. And, you know, let's not even get into the torturing of suspects because that was one of the questions as well. When you think about it, the Republicans are, are, are typically conservative. The Democrats are typically a little bit more liberal. And then that takes us to the populists. Populists are going to believe in regulating both bedroom and wallet. And the idea here is, is that they want to look out for the little man, Joe and Jane Sixpack. The government can make better decisions for Joe and Jane Sixpack than Joe and Jane Sixpack can make for themselves. So if the libertarians don't believe in any regulation or as little as possible, the populists are going to believe in every regulation. And what's nice for the populists is, okay, we're going to help. The danger is, is that the more that they help, the more that they regulate. And the more that they regulate, the less freedom that we have. And populists typically have control issues. I'm trying to think of who it was in both classes, but I'm, I'm sure I called both of you out in both classes as far as who was most likely to have control issues. Actually, Sarah, you were the one in the 10 o'clock class that has populist tendencies. And you do have control issues, don't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, the way that the look on your face, you, you totally do. Uh, you'll see this. At 9 o'clock, people, I'm going to do my best. If there isn't a video posted tomorrow, then obviously don't worry as much about ideology. 
um, but everybody else will have it and it's going to be posted. And as soon as we're done here, I'm going to upload these and see if I can't get those added as well so you can take a look. Does anybody have any other questions? What's the breakdown of that test again? I think it's going to be, I think I'm going to give you five out of eight short answers and then maybe 35 multiple choices, so it'll be a 95 pointer. And then what I'll do is roll in the other 20 points from that take home, um, depending upon how you got them. How many and, uh, probably 35. They'll be tricky. Um, I'm going to get in there to, on Friday at about 8-ish. So if you want to come in early at any point, you can. If you want to come in there at 8 and stay until 12, you can do that. I've got the room the whole time. I don't think you'll have to, but if you decide that that's what you want to do, some people are extended that way. Good luck. Stephen, you can cut it. <laughs>